So here we've got Pamela Smith. Um, she's a senior cloud, op cloud ops advocate at Microsoft with a background focus on messaging and collaboration, virtualization and storage. She's also a VMware expert and co-hosts the Current Status podcast, which some of you may have heard of. Um, outside of work, she enjoys writing blogs and technical articles and is considered to be one of the top 50 tech influencers and thought leaders in the world. Uh, Pumala will be talking to us about how to achieve the acceleration and agility required in IT within the guardrails using cloud native tools in Azure. So please put your hands together and welcome Pumala Schmidt. First I need, am I on? Okay. Hold on, I got pockets. So a dress with pockets, right? It's freaking amazing. Yeah, like you have absolute power. And not like fake pockets, they're real pockets. So I could probably put a, a car in here. Okay, so how to run with scissors, acceleration with guardrails for your cloud journey. Actually, before we get into this talk, I always like to tell a little story of how I got here. And I'm from the United States. I live outside of Philadelphia. Who's heard of Philadelphia? Yeah, yeah. I live about an hour and a half. So I got on an airplane, obviously, right? I had to cross over this little pond that you know, separates us. And as I'm getting on the plane, I got a board, right? You have a boarding pass. And typically, you do have a paper boarding pass or your iPhone, whatever phone that you have. And it allows you to board on the plane. Now, I don't use a boarding pass. I stare into a camera. And when I stare into the camera, it has a picture of my passport. Pretty cool, huh? Facial recognition. That's how I boarded the plane to get over here. Uh, so throughout the year, I've been traveling a lot, just like coming up here, boarding a plane without a boarding pass, just using facial recognition. I was in Hong Kong, going through security, staring into the camera. There's my passport in Hong Kong. Yeah, I see your eyebrows raising. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you really start to think, like, wow, how did I get my data? Like, did they, did I actually authorize this? I'm sure I did at some point when I applied for my passport, reading that fine print, you know, it's like 57 pages long and you need a magnifying glass to read it, that I signed my life away and they, you know, they can share data with whomever. But the moral of the story here is facial recognition technology, your data, my data, is now being shared across literally the world. Who's governing that? Who's governing your data? Because I just read two months ago that Heathrow is going to be implementing facial recognition to board all international flights. That is going to affect every person sitting in this room. Yeah, that's kind of scary. So who, you know, who's going to have your personal data now? How are they protecting that data? Or is it going to be wide open to the world? Who's governing that? So that leads into the talk, right? Guardrails for your cloud journey, because almost everything is in the cloud. I mean, let's, let's face it. It's on-premises. It's not dead. It's still here. But the focus of technology today and the future really is cloud technology. And I always like to say, that using cloud technology is like running with scissors. You pick up and you go. Because you can literally spin up an environment in what, five, 10, 15 minutes, and you're up and you, you can just go. But there's a risk with that. Just like you're running, and pretend this is a pair of scissors, you know, you can just pick up and go, right? But what happens if you trip? You could possibly poke yourself. Get a little prick, a little blood, where you can stab yourself and it goes right through and you puncture every organ you have and you're laying there dead. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty blunt, right? <laughs> that's, you know, and so you relate that to technology. It's a risk when you go into the cloud. You can pick up and go real quick. You can spin up all sorts of applications. They're all cloud native, lift and shift. You can do all that. But if you do it quickly without governance without a plan, without some sort of action that has some controls and measures, you could really get hurt. I mean, it's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't read something in, you know, the major, I wanted to say newspaper, but who really reads the newspaper anymore? You know, online, 
that you don't hear about some sort of data breach. Something's been exposed. I, I want to say, didn't BA, British Airways, get fined like $26 million or something for that data breach? I don't know the exact numbers, but that's pretty heavy, right? That's a lot of money. Verizon, who's heard of Verizon? It's the largest, one of the largest uh, carriers in the US. Huge. They were working with a startup and their, uh, their partner. And they had a, I won't say a data breach, but they were using another cloud provider, not Azure. Starts with an A. <laughs> and <laughs> simple file share, right? Used for logs. Completely exposed on the internet. Anybody could have gotten to it and had customer data in it. It was just one of those things that I'm sure was an afterthought or just completely slipped, right? We all, we all have those, those pilots, those POCs. Let's get this up and running. We'll go back later. We'll go back and you know, fill the holes. Who all here has worked in administration sysadmin where you're pilot, piloting a project and you're forced to just go, we, we got to get this up and running. We'll go back and clean that up later. How often you go back and clean up? I mean, <laughs> my, my background came from sysadmin. I used to work on exchange and all sorts of other uh, applications and virtualization. And, you know, I was in the infrastructure world, and I was involved in many, many projects that was, let's get up and go, right? We got to go. We got to do this. We'll go back and clean that up. Well, I'm going to say 95% of the time, we didn't go back and clean up until we were forced to, and, or somebody flagged us and said, yeah, you have a lot of holes. It's like Swiss cheese. Yeah, so that's, but that's the reality of how we work, how, you know, uh, IT admins, whatever name we call ourselves now, IT pros, sysadmins, People that I like to say, people that make things, you know, work. <laughs> Pretty much, we're we're doers, but we we're so busy that it's it's not our fault that we're forgetting this stuff, right? It's just because we're just going so fast. So that technical governance, we have every intention to do it, and and sometimes we are doing it, but with cloud we oftentimes forget about it because we are spinning the businesses or the businesses are, are doing the application writing. They're developing it without our help oftentimes because they're doing it on, on their own and they can, you know, they, they, they can. I mean, this whole, uh, I think I saw a webinar on it where developers, you can spin up an environment and you don't need your IT teams to help you. Totally true. Absolutely true. I'm not going to argue with that. But when that happens, that, that technical governance, you know, the, the, the checks and balances, right? Making sure you have all your security measures in place. And if you have got, you know, regulations that you have to follow, that checks and balances that's happening, you forget about that because you are running so quick. So that traditional approach that we used to have before this, this whole cloud thing came about was you would request something, an application or a server, there was always like a custodian person that was a road blocker for you. They were, they, were, they were the gatekeepers. They were the gatekeepers of speed, agility, getting things done. And now we've got to kind of change that approach because governance, typically when, you, when someone says governance, how do you feel? Kind of like, uh, right. Yeah. Gosh darn it. It's a governance police. They're going to stop us. They're going to slow us. It's kind of like when your security team, right? Oh God, we can't tell security that. They're going to slow us down. We're not going to be able to finish this project. We've delayed six months. I know because I've used security that way before if I wanted to delay something, <laughs> pull security in. But <laughs> That's a, this is being recorded, now they know my trick, you know? <laughs> but that traditional approach of having that gatekeeper, it did slow you down. So it defeated the whole purpose of having this acceleration, this speed, because businesses nowadays, you need to have speed, right? If you don't have speed, you don't have accel acceleration, you are not making money. The business is not competing with the market. And without competing the market, you don't have a business. You're gonna go under, I'm gonna be pretty blunt about it. 
everyone is going so fast. We have the technologies to allow you to go so fast, to compete with each other. And we, as, as the IT team, the infrastructure team supporting, we have to be able to support the business. That's really what we're there for, to support them, to enable the businesses, developers, uh, you know, business teams, enable them to do their jobs efficiently, quickly, and to make money so we can get a paycheck. <laughs> yeah, with, without them, we're not getting paycheck, right? We're not the sales team. They're out there you know, doing their job, but we're supporting them. But if we're being roadblockers because we're, you know, we're saying you can't go to the cloud or you can't do that because we're not meeting governance, we're kind of defeating this purpose. We're not helping. So we take this traditional approach and we, we change it up. And we say, you know what? Let's give people guardrails. Guardrails is essentially, what is guardrails? Like a highway. Highway's on the guardrail, right? Keeps you in line. Everyone just kind of goes in the same lane for the most part. People don't, you know, venture out and hit the guardrails. Country, country road, there's no guardrails. You can go, you know, whatever, but you can also get off the side of the road and crash and burn. On the highway, guardrails, <laughs> guardrails keep you in check. Uh, you know, and everybody knows they can just go straight, they can go fast. Guardrails with governance, same, same concept applies. Also, it's like a playground. Playground is uh, surround, surrounded by a fence. Kids inside the playground, they know they can play on the playground, right? Monkey bars, slide, but the rules are you can't push each other. Well, if they push each other, someone's gonna get hurt, right? And then you have a fence. Kids inside the fence know that they can't jump over that fence. It keeps them in check. And everybody can play and have fun. Same concept, guardrails. We're letting developers, we're letting people that actually need to do their job, do their job, have fun, but within boundaries so that you get those checks and balances. We're meeting regulation, GDPR. That's really, yeah, apparently that's really important over this side of the pond. <laughs> so we, we use cloud native governance. We use the tools built in to our cloud, Azure, but to be honest, it's in every cloud regardless if it's Azure, AWS, Google, IBM, and I want to say Oracle, too. <laughs> but all, all the clouds, even your small ISPs, they, they, all have, they, all, they all have some sort of governance tools that are built in for you. Every application has it, Exchange has it, SharePoint has it. You, you've, got, you've got these building tools that enable you to enable them, you know, enable these settings so that your teams that are using them they can just do their job without having to, you know, constantly come to you. And then you're actually freeing up time. You're getting, you know, you're not only freeing up time, but you're getting cost savings. You're, you're getting your control, which is huge with governance. It's about control, right? Checks and balances, controlling what's going on. Um, and then there is obviously the cost management piece of it, because cost management is part of the governance, because, you know, who really cares about the budget until you care about the budget at the end of the month and you get that nice bill that has lots of zeros at the end. And you're like, whoa, you have to govern budgets. Otherwise, you could, you know, that, that red line. Who likes to have a red line at the end of the month? Controlling spending. So governance is more than just the tools, right? I'm sure you've heard this saying, people, process, and tools in the whole DevOps world. It goes with governance. It actually goes with every technology. So I can stand up here for the next, what, 30, 40 minutes left and just talk about all the cool stuff, you know, all the cool tools in Azure that's gonna give you governance and you're gonna be all secure. But the most important thing is the people, that's you sitting in the room, and the process. Because the tools are always gonna be there, regardless of where you're at, what, regardless of technology, we have the tools available, or you can make the tools. But the people and the process, that's the key to making any type of technology work. DevOps, governance, you know, IT administration, all of it. All those three come together, and without the three, you're not gonna be 100% 100, 100 successful. 
right? You, you've got to get you got to get people on board to develop the process to figure out what's important. What do I need to govern? What do I need to do? What's important to our business, our requirements for being successful? Gather the people together, make up some processes, and then the tools are there to help you enable. Governance for the cloud. So now we're going to get talking about, you know, what kind of tools are available for you, specifically in Azure, because I work for Microsoft. So we're going to talk about Azure Policy. I mean, it is what it is, Azure Policy. We're also going to talk about Blueprints, and that's governance at scale. I'll briefly mention Resource Graph, because that's a really, really cool tool that I like, but it takes a little bit longer and uh, more in-depth. Management Groups, and then a little bit of cost management. But this session today, our primary focus is going to be role-based access control, Azure policies, and blueprints. So we'll first get off into role-based access control. Technically, it's not a tool, right? It's really, it's really not, I'll be honest with you. RBAC, it's not a tool. But it's the foundational layer of building governance. Regardless of what regulation you have, what company you're in, what co country, whatever you do, RBAC, role-based access control, is your foundational layer. Even if you don't do any of the other stuff I'm going to talk about. I encourage this. Why? Because this is access management. Role-based access control determines who can do what within your organization, cloud or even on-premises. Defining who has what role and what they can do to those resources. Creating roles, because does everybody in your organization need access to everything? I mean, does your purchasing person who also does have access to Azure, especially if they're the ones that signed up to the account and they pay the bill, uh, they don't need global administrator rights, do they? I mean, that's like domain admin. But by default, that actually does happen. So you're going to have to go and define who has roles. Do your developers need to have global administrator rights? Maybe one person. Most likely not, right? And this is where you determine, OK, your role is based off their job function. But there's my, I'm going to go into my soapbox of your, your cloud team, right? your cloud architect team, where you take a, a group of leads or architects, engineers, maybe one from each department and space, and define them as a, a, a cloud team. And those, those individuals would be given global administrator rights. Keep that group small, because you do need people in that role group. For, you know, you can't give it to just one person. As well, if they get hit by a bus, get sick. I've been in those situations where, or that person has left, and, they, and you reset their password, and nobody knows. You're like, oh my god, you know, that one person. So yeah, have, defining, defining the role of your, your cloud team. Defining the roles for developers. Defining a role for your operations team. Because you can create custom roles based off specific functions. So let's say you have uh, a 24-hour help desk, right? Follow the sun uh, support. And you've got a particular set of servers that are just a really pain in the rear end. And every night, they just need to be rebooted. They just do. Windows server. Sorry, it happens. <laughs> I, I used to run a, a group of fax servers that every so often, the fax service would just shut down, and it would just clunk. And yes, 2018, 2019, we ran faxes like there was no tomorrow. And it just, those servers just need to be rebooted. They're Windows servers. For some reason, they just did. So you could take that scenario and create a custom role group just for, you know, 24-hour help desk or operations. And the only access and rights they have is to reboot VMs in Azure. And that's it. They can't start. They can't shut down, can't do anything. But they can hit the restart button just to kick that server back up in the gear and your service is back up. 
I mean, that's, that's how granular you can be with RBAC. And I'm sure most of you are sitting there like, hmm, I think I've got some scenarios. I can, I can do that. You can create, you know, view only. You can create just, well, we've got 70 build and roles. So, you know, for the most part, that should cover everybody. But the scenario I just mentioned, that restart, that's a custom role. Quickly go and create that, you know. There's all sorts of scenarios you can do. But for the most part, the, the, built, the 70 built-in roles should be suffice. Network contributor, people in that group, all they have access to is network roles. They can't add a storage account to a VM, but they can manage network resources. OK, so now we're going to get into Azure Policy. So when you have RBAC, you can actually, you know, you take it to the next level with using policy now. So now, you, now you've done your, your base foundational layer of governance. Take it to the next level. And now I'm going to do some auditing. Now I'm going to do some real control. Because access management is, is only the first layer. Policy, though, policy adds auditing. It adds remediation. This is where you're checking those checks and balances. This is where your uh, controls of what's being deployed, where things are being deployed, which is pretty important with GDPR. You can create policies that restrict what's being deployed. So let's say your developers. You, you, know, you know you want them to do, to do their job, right? It's just, you know, it's just the way it is, but you don't want them to constantly come ask you permission or, hey, I need you to deploy a VM or I need to you know, spin up a resource group. They should be able to do that on their own. So you, you can create policies to control what type of virtual machines, what type of resources can be deployed by specific people. That does two things. One, it controls you know, what's being created. But there are some cost benefits that that's going to help with your cost management. Because if you are giving people access rights to deploy all sorts of resources, at some point, that's going to turn around and, and kind of smack you in the rear end and go, wow, when you get that bill, right? If everyone is spinning up VMs with 32 gigs of RAM, and running premium SSD drives for a test system, because that's really practical, right? <laughs> but every application always wants you to have the best of everything, all resources. You've got to have you know, the best VM. But we all know most people in a test can get away with a, a slightly smaller VM, and you don't need premium SSD drives to run a test environment. I mean, that, that's my opinion, but I think most of you are probably going to agree with that. But if they're doing that, that's going to cost you something. It's going to cost your business. It's going to mean you're going to get you know, cloud shock then. But with policies, Azure policies, you can control that. And I don't say restrict, right? It's control. Because the second you say restrict to the teams, now they're getting, what do you mean you're restricting me? It's all about control. You can do your job. Here are the defined list of resources you can deploy and where you can deploy it only in the you know, UK data centers, or only in the US. We can restrict it down to there. Here are just uh, a couple samples of the policies that are already built into Azure. Of course, you can create your own custom policies, but there, there's just a lot that you can go through. And I say a lot. <laughs> I think there's like two or 300. But we also have Azure initiatives. So Azure Policy Initiatives, it's, it's Azure Policies, but with steroids. So Azure Policies is just one policy definition that controls or audits something, like the restrict location or restrict resource type from being deployed. Azure Initiatives is a collection of Azure Policies that are grouped together to define a particular goal. So for instance, you have DMZ servers, right? DM servers, for the most part, have more restrictions, restrictions than servers that are in, back, in your back end. Would everybody agree with me? Yeah. You, you, know, you want to protect those DMZ servers. So you could create an Azure policy initiative with a uh, 
I say a bunch, with, with a bunch of policies that all fall in line with protecting DMZ servers. You know, um, enabling diagnostics or auditing uh, certain ports that are open, making sure storage accounts are encrypted, yada, yada, yada. But that initiative is ensuring that your DMZ servers are protected. We, and we also have built-in initiatives, which takes that work that you would normally do of collecting all those policies, right, to define initiative. We've created built-in Azure initiatives that, one, um, built in towards specific regulations, but also just, you know, initiatives to be more secure. One initiative I always like to talk about is the PCI compliance. Who's heard of PCI? Yeah. Yeah, if you're on the internet, you know, and you're accepting payments, you, you know about PCI. So we actually have an Azure Policy Initiative for, for PCI compliance. It's got, uh, gosh, 60 some policy definitions. It does auditing, it does remediation, and it does an audit check of the resources that have been applied that policy to make sure that it's PCI compliance. All the policy definitions within that initiative map back to the PCI uh, regulations. So we've taken that work that you normally would do on premises, right? I, I know there's a, a common set of guidelines you have to follow, security, your systems have to be patched, yada, yada, yada. We've taken all that work for you. All you gotta do is now assign that initiative to some, you know, to a resource group, a subscription. And that runs, once it runs through the evaluation, you're gonna be able to determine if your resource group or subscription or whatever resource that you applied it to is PCI compliant. And I'm actually gonna show you an initiative that I've deployed on a resource group. Okay. Do that and then I'll tap. Okay, now you can see I'm in the Azure portal. And we're just going to go to one of my various resource group demos that I have here. That's awesome. It actually went really fast. The internet is being good to me today. <laughs> so when we do Azure policies, we'll just go into the policy section, and you can actually just search for Azure policies on the, on the search bar as well. And when you get to Azure policies, the first thing you're gonna come up to is the compliance section. And we wait for the three bars to kick in. So let me just expand this. So this is our audit PCI initiative that I just spoke about. And as you can see, I'm 50% compliant, and I just, we're just gonna go in here real quick. And these are all the policy definitions that define that initiative. For instance, span. MFA should be enabled on accounts with owner permissions. It's going to check for that. Because if someone's deploying a subscription or a resource group and there's a particular user in there, and who, you know, who really loves MFA? Let's be honest here, it's great, right? It protects you, but who really likes it? I'm gonna be honest, it's a pain, right? Yeah, but you gotta do it. But sometimes, you know, if you're working really fast, I see you, evil the air. It, yeah, it, it happens, right? Let's just bypass that really quick. You know, that's our back door. Yeah, but if you need to be PCI compliant, and somebody created an account or has a special account that they don't want to do an MFA because it slows them down by two minutes, you're going to see that here. And then, you know, you'll get an alert and you can find out who it is and then you can make that nice phone call or that lovely email that you have to type up that says, hey, I know that account doesn't MFA, you really should enable that. External accounts with read permissions should be removed. This audit is awesome. 
Remember that story I told you about Verizon and their partner and how that share was exposed with customer data? This audit policy would have been great in that you know, certain scenario. A share policy would have ran and checked. So said, oh, hmm. There's people there with access that we can have. So all these different policy definitions are going to alert you, right? It's not going to stop anybody from doing their job. That's, the one, that's one of the beauties I like about Azure policy. Yes, there are restrictions with creation of items, but if you have an existing environment up and running and you apply a policy or an initiative to it, you won't stop somebody from running. You're not going to shut down a server or storage access because that's just hooky. They're going to, someone's going to be mad at you. You're going to get a nasty phone call. But what's going to happen, though, is you're going to be alerted on it. You're going to see this compliance, and you're going to go back to your security team, your governance team. You're going to go back to the developer and say, OK, we're not PCI compliant. X, Y, Z. Here's where we are, and here's where we're not. What do we need to do? And I say we, because it's just not them. It's you, too. It's all of us. What do we need to do to make sure that we are 100% compliant and not 57% compliant, right? Because it's a we effort. Because they're going to need you to help determine what is not compliant. And they may need you to help configure encryption or certain settings. So this is a. This resource group actually is a funny story. So this demo is a demo that I deployed that our, uh, actually Neil Peterson wrote, and he has a session in the other room there. Uh, awesome demo, bunch of VMs. It's about log analytics, and we actually present it for Microsoft United Four. And I, when I was doing, you know, thinking about doing this demo, I'm like, you know what? I wonder if we have compliance and governance. So throughout my different demos I've been doing, I've been taking environments that my own team has been creating and applying, gov like applying policy and just checking what we've been doing. And so I'm going to call out the deal and kind of pick on them a little bit. But this environment is not PCI compliant. Uh, and I'm sure if I pulled up some of the other ones that our group has done, they're not compliant. Thing things have been missed. Why? Because we've been going so fast. <coughs> or we forget what we need to do to make sure we're compliant. So that was a little, a little side note. I'm throwing governance on my own team. OK. Let me just go back here. So we go back to the compliance page. So there's a remediation portion of it. If you have some policies, if it is a deploy, if not exists definition, meaning that it's just, it's just not an audit, you can actually create remediation tasks. Let's say in order to perform an audit, a VM needs to have a VM extension added to it. And that's a, a little app extension on your VMs that say that I can run evaluations on the machine. So if you don't have that, the policy is going to say it's not compliant because it doesn't have a, uh, an extension so it can run the audit check. You could create a remediation task. And the remediation task just deploys the extension. So once that is created and deployed, you can actually do real checks and real audits. And you're going to pass uh, a certain, another percentage of your compliance. Expand this. There's also SQL Server remediation tasks as well. So if you have certain versions that are required within your organization of SQL, you can actually have that deployed through Azure Policy or deploy threat protection. Or you can require Azure Security Center to be enabled. And that can be automatically done through policy. So you don't have to go into every um, subscription to do it. 
do it all through policy. We also just announced last Thursday, I was actually on the plane when it was announced, so you can create remediation tasks for tagging. Tags. Who knows of tags, right? Tags. Tags are awesome. Tags are great for cost management because now you can tag things for billings and whatnot, you know, uh, department cost centers, departments. Tagging is great from an administration standpoint. What, what systems are doing what? You can tag them. And we just announced last Thursday that now when you tag something and you create a policy to tag a resource prior to last week, it would only tag new items or new, new resources being created or a uh, resource got an update. It would only apply that tag. So prior, you had to go back and manually apply tags to existing resources, which I'm going to be honest, was, wasn't really efficient. It kind of sucked. You know, we wrote like scripts to kind of, you know, alleviate that. But now we have uh, released Azure Policy Remediation for Tags. So let's say you create a policy. You can use one of the building policies to define tags for a resource group or subscription. You know, application, uh, production applications. And you want every resource in that resource group to have that tag or the cost center. What they'll do is they'll go through an evaluation. And if it notices that there's resources that don't have the tag, you're going to be notified in the compliance. And it's going to tell you, you can create a remediation task now. So all these existing resources that don't have the tag can be forced to have the tag without having the right fancy PowerShell scripts in the back end to apply it or uh, you know, forcing some type of update on your VMs or your resources. So now the remediation allows the policy to do everything in one step. Great for organization, great for uh, visibility into your environment. Not only from a compliance standpoint, but visibility just in general, knowing what's there, right? Tags with policy lets you know what and who is deploying what resources. I'm just going to kind of sidetrack a little bit on that. So go to the dashboard here. Let me see. There we go. Tagging and policies are awesome together. As soon as this comes up, you'll see why. Wait for it. <laughs> Way for it. There we go. There we go. We got some colors. We got some graphs. Everybody loves graphs, right? They're pretty, all the colors. Most people are visual. I mean, we all love PowerShell. It's quick and easy, but looking at stats on a black and white screen or an Excel spreadsheet, it's kind of okay, I get it, but seeing your environment with the rainbows visually like this, that's more, that hits your brain a little bit better, right? Let me go back here. So this is an Azure Resource Inventory dashboard that you can actually create. And a lot of the resources here are using tags via policy. So now, you know, I've got this dashboard that I've created that gives me visibility into my, my, my environment. I know virtual machines by operating system. Grouped 14, 13, Linux. Count by resource types. With Az and this is with Azure Resource Graph, so you're wondering you know, how you're getting to this. So Azure Resource Graph, another component of Azure uh, Governance, uses the Kusto query language. It actually is powering the all resources within the Azure portal, which you all have access to if you're using Azure. The Kusto query language is a lot more powerful than the existing portal platform. It does query beyond 2,000 items. So now when you look at your all resources, right now you're limited to 2,000. I believe that's going to be changing for everybody once you 
move over to the new all resources, it's actually going to pull up all your environment. You know, if you have 200,000 items, resources, it's going to pull that all up in the view. And it pulls it all up here in the Azure inventory. With Resource Graph, it's only going to pull up information I have access to. So you can actually save this, uh, this dashboard and share the JSON file with another individual, or you can share the dashboard out. Or you know, download the JSON file, give it to somebody, they upload it into their portal. They're going to see the same tiles, but their data is going to be slightly different if they have different permissions based off of your RBAC. Right? Based off of your, your roles that you've defined for that particular user, they're going to probably see something slightly different, but they're going to see visibility into the environment. So that's sort of a, a sneak peek of Azure Resource Graph. So let's go back to the slide deck. I think my heart stops like for a minute when I do that. Does anybody else have that? <laughs> when you switch back, you kind of go, is it going to switch back? Yes, it did. <laughs> and the people that shook their head, yeah, we've all been there. We're like, it's going to switch. <laughs> so this is where we get to Azure Blueprints. And this is also another favorite tool of mine. Azure Blueprints gives you the automation, orchestration, Governance at scale. God, I felt like a marketing person that way. But, it's, it's, but that's what it is. You can orchestrate governance, and you can automate governance. So that RBAC that we talked about, the policies, all that stuff that you're doing now to give some governance, and you're doing it individually to subscription groups and resource groups, that's time consuming if you're doing it individually and you have 1,000 resources, or even 50, or 10, right? It, it is. It's going to slow you down. And then you're going to be really upset and have no time to do anything else because you're applying governance. And that's when it gets really pain. You're like, I hate this governance. I don't want to do it. Because most people, if it takes too long, you tend not to want to do it, right? So Blueprints kind of takes that work for you away. It does all of it. It allows you to have governance at scale. It works by the cloud engineer. I love that new term. Cloud engineer, cloud architect, us, the people doers, miracle makers of IT, we create a blueprint in Azure. And we add artifacts to it. The artifacts are your RBAC, role based access control, your ARM templates, policy definitions. You can even have custom scripts. Those are all artifacts that you apply to your blueprint. And once you apply it to the blueprint and you take the steps to publish it, define the version, and then you apply it to a subscription or multiple subscriptions. Boom, right? Just do it once. Define your artifacts. Apply it to subscription. There you go. Have their subscription coming up. Hey, same requirements, right? Let's say you have a production or a test environment. You can create a blueprint for that. Blueprint for my test environment. It's got specific policies that my developers can only deploy my cheaper VMs and no SSD because it just costs too much money. And they're restricted to just deploying resources in the UK or in Europe. But they can do anything they want within those guardrails. Define that blueprint, publish it, and I'm going to say subscription A. Now you have another team coming up. They, another, they want another you know, test environment. Don't have to think about it. So you know what? Sure, you can have 10 test environments. And it's all going to have governance, because all you're doing is now just applying that same blueprint that you created to a, a, this new environment. You've got governance. Every time somebody wants to spin up an environment, a subscription for testing, there you go. Same concept applies for your uh, production environment, which is going to have probably more restrictions on who can make changes and whatnot. You, with Blueprints, you can lock your Blueprints, too, meaning you can lock your resources so that even an owner of a subscription can't make changes. They can't change the policy. That's very cool. <laughs> uh, you know, you can 
You can do that for production environments because most likely you probably don't want people making changes in there too much, right? Deletions, whatnot, because deleting a server in the middle of the day is just not cool. <laughs> it's happened before. I've lived it before. It does happen. And that's where resource locks come into play. And you lock your, your, lock your blueprints so that owners can't make changes. You're protecting yourself from yourself. And then we have built-in blueprints. The built-in blueprints are similar to that of the initiatives in where we've taken that work for you of figuring out what policies that need to be defined to, to have uh, regulation. We actually have some built-in UK requirements. I think that's one of the new blueprints that uh, we just released. But FedRAMP, NIST, PCI compliance blueprint. It has the definitions that you would need to have PCI compliance and more. And then you can add your individual RBAC settings if you want and your individual requirements. You can build off that blueprint, the built-in one, and apply it to your subscriptions. Blueprints also grows with your business because your policies will change as your business grows and evolves. It should. I mean, who's all gone back and re-looked at your different policies that you've had? And, and things change. So Blueprints works with you. You can go back, modify a Blueprint, update it, republish it. There you go. You have multiple versions of Blueprints because that's just how life is. You're going to have multiple versions of things. You can go back to a previous version because your business is going to grow. So, want to learn more? We've got MS Learn that you can actually go through and look at the different uh, learning modules for governance. There's RBAC, there's some policy in there. So, you can actually go through and, and learn how to do some of the governance I talked about. We've got Docs that, will, you know, that talks uh, in depth on how to apply some of these settings. And also, I'm going to do a little shout out for Microsoft Ignite the Tour as well. We'll be here in London in January, and we've got a complete learning path on governance. We've got a fundamentals one, which Anthony Bartolo, my teammate, is actually creating. I believe, I believe he's going to be, are you going to be in London? No, in London. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be traveling around the world, and you can come see us, talk about governance, talk about. You know, Azure DevOps, I think Abel is going to be doing some, and Sarah as well back there. So there's going to be lots more technology that is free. You don't need a credit card. Uh, so those are the learn more options. You can also get a free Azure trial if you don't have a free account. This gives you 12 free months for you just to play around. Great lab environment. I actually have several of them. <laughs> yeah, because you don't know until you actually start playing with things, and that's when you learn, you know, you realize, oh, wow. I didn't know that worked that way. So great opportunity to test things out, try it out in your environment. If you have an enterprise agreement, talk to your account rep. They can probably spin up a trial uh, uh, test environment for you. Our cloud governance docs, as I mentioned before, a whole bunch of documentation we have. We have our cloud adoption framework section that talks about you know, how to uh, migrate yourself into the cloud using governance and all the tools we have. And there is the end of my talk. I think I hit on time. But overall, that's, that's governance, right? And I actually, I took a slide out and it's a really cool slide I had. It was, um, with great knowledge comes great responsibility. <laughs> As people get, yeah, Spider-Man, yeah. But actually, it was, I think, uh, Winston Churchill actually first did that. But that does apply to governance. It does apply to us as technologists, right? We have great knowledge. We do. We are keepers of data and knowledge. With that comes great responsibility as developers, operations, technologists, you name whatever we want to call ourselves. 
there's some great responsibility on us to protect that data, you know, your customer's data, your data, and how we ensure integrity of that data, right? With great knowledge comes great responsibility. So when we, when we do the cloud, that's sort of what I wanna, I wanna leave people with, right? It's awesome, I love the cloud. It's, it enables us to do things really fast. But let's do it in a way where we're protecting each other, we're protecting our customer, and yet we're still getting, you know, we're still hitting that bottom line. You're still meeting the business needs. And that's where the great responsibility comes from. So there you go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>